Hi everybody and welcome to Packets and Frames. Let's begin. Packets and frames are small pieces of data that, when forming together, make a larger piece of information or message. However, they are two different things in the OSI model. A frame is at layer 2, the data link layer, meaning there is no such information as IP addresses. Think of this as putting an envelope within an envelope and sending it away. The first envelope will be the packet that you mail, but once it is opened, the envelope within still exists and contains data, and this is a frame. This process is called encapsulation, which we discussed in room 3, the OSI model, which by the way, I did a uh, walkthrough of uh, this room, so you can check that out if, um, if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, at this stage, it's safe to assume that when we're talking about anything IP addresses, we're talking about packets. When the uh, encapsulating information is stripped away, we're talking about the frame itself. Packets are an efficient way of communicating data across network devices, such as those explained in task 1. Because this data is exchanged in small pieces, there is less chance of bottlenecking occurring across a network than large messages being sent at once. For example, when loading an image from a website, this image is not sent to your computer as a whole, but rather small pieces where it is reconstructed on your computer. Take the image below as an illustration of this process. The dog's picture is divided into three packets where it is reconstructed when it reaches the computer to form the final image. And yes, you, we can um, see that right here. Packets have different structures that are dependent upon the type of packet that is being sent. As we'll come on to discuss, networking is full of standards and protocols that act as a set of rules for how the packet is handled on a device. With the internet predicted to have uh, approximately 50 billion devices connected by the end of 2020, things quickly get out of hand if there is no standardization. Let's continue with our example of the internet protocol. A packet using this protocol will have a set of headers that contain additional pieces of information to the data that is being sent across a network. Some notable headers include time to live. This field sets an expiry timer for the packet to not clog up your network if it never manages to reach a host or escape. Checksum. This field provides integrity checking for protocols such as TCP IP. If any data is changed, this value will be different from what was expected and therefore corrupt. Source address. The IP address of the device that the packet is being sent from so that data knows where to return to. Destination address. The device's IP address the packet is being sent to so that data knows where to travel next. And now let's answer the questions. Uh, what is the name uh, for a piece of data when it does have IP uh, addressing information? And that will be packet. What is the name for a piece of data when it does not have IP uh, addressing information? And that will be frame. Okay, and now let's move on to the next task, which is TCP IP, the three-way handshake. TCP, or Transmission Control Protocol for short, is another one of these rules used in networking. This protocol is very similar to the OSI model that we have previously discussed in room 3 of this module so far. The TCP IP protocol consists of four layers and is arguably just a summarized version of the OSI model. These layers are application, transport, internet and network interface. Very similar to how the OSI model works, information is added to each layer of the TCP model as the piece of data or packet traverses it. As you may recall, this process is known as encapsulation, where the reverse of this process is decapsulation. One defining feature of TCP is that it is connection-based, which means the TCP must establish a connection between, uh, between uh, both a client and a device acting as a server before data is sent. Because of this, TCP guarantees that any data sent will be received on the other end. This process is named the three-way handshake, which is something we'll come on to discuss shortly. A table comparing the advantages and disadvantages of uh, TCP is located below. Okay, 
Uh, so first, uh, guarantees the integrity of data. Uh, requires a reliable connection between the two devices. If one small chunk of data is not received, then the entire chunk of data cannot be used and must be resent. Capable of synchronizing two devices to prevent each other from being flooded with data in the wrong order. A slow connection can bottleneck another device as the connection will be reserved on the other device the whole time. Performs a lot more processes for reliability and TCP is significantly slower than UDP because more work, computing, has to be done by the devices using this protocol. TCP packets contain various sections of information known as headers that are added from encapsulation. Let's explain some of the crucial headers in the table below. Okay, let's see. Source port. This value is the port opened by the sender to send the TCP packet from. This value is chosen randomly out of the uh, ports from 0 to 65,535 that aren't already in use at the time. Destination port. This value is uh, the port number that an application or service is running on the remote host, uh, you know, the one receiving the data. Uh, for example, a web server running on port 80. Unlike the source port, this value is not chosen at random. Source IP. This is the IP address of the device that is sending the packet. Destination IP. This is the IP address of the device that the packet is destined for. Sequence number. When a connection occurs, the first piece of data transmitted is given a random number. We will explain this more in depth further on. Acknowledgement number. After a piece of, uh, piece of data has been given a sequence number, the number for the next piece of data will have the sequence number plus one. We'll also explain this more in depth further on. Checksum. This value is what gives TCP integrity. A mathematical calculation is made where the output is remembered. When the receiving device performs the mathematical calculation, the data must be corrupt if the output is different, different from what was sent. Data. This header is where the data, that is bytes of a file that is being trans transmitted, is stored. Flag. This header determines how the packet should be handled by either device during the handshake process. Specific flags will determine specific behaviors, which is what we'll come on to explain below. Next, we'll come on to discuss the three-way handshake, the term given for the process used to establish a connection between two devices. The three-way handshake, uh, handshake communicates using a few special messages. The table below highlights the main ones. Okay, let's see. SYN. A SYN message is the initial packet sent by a client during the handshake. This packet is used to initiate a connection and synchronize the two devices together. We'll explain this further later on. SYN ACK. This packet is sent by the receiving device, server, to acknowledge the synchronization attempt from the client. ACK. The acknowledgement packet can be used by either the client or server to acknowledge that a series of messages or packets have been successfully received. Data. Once a connection has been established, data, such as bytes of a file, is sent via the data message. Uh, fin. This packet is used to cleanly or properly close the connection after it has been complete. And reset. This packet abruptly ends all communication. This is the last resort and indicates there was some problem during the process. For example, if the service or application is um, not working correctly or the system has faults such as low resources. The diagram below shows a normal three-way handshake, pro uh, three -way handshake process uh, between Alice and Bob. In real life, this would be between two devices. Any send data is given a random number sequence and is reconstructed using this number sequence and incrementing by one. Both computers must agree on the same number sequence for data to be sent in the correct order. This order is agreed upon during three steps. First step, send client. Here is my initial sequence number or ISN to synchronize with zero. And second step, send ACK server. Here is my initial sequence number to synchronize with 5000 uh, 5, and I acknowledge your initial number sequence 0. And then the third step, uh, ACK 
clients. I acknowledge your initial sequence number of 5000. Here is some data that is my ISN plus one, right? So 5000 plus one, okay? TCP closing a connection. Let's quickly explain the process behind TCP closing a connection. First, TCP will close a connection once a device has determined that the other device has successfully received all of the data. Because TCP reserves um, system resources on a device, it is best practice to close the TCP connections as soon as possible. To initiate the closure of a TCP connection, the device will send a FIN packet to the other device. Of course, with TCP, the other device will also have to acknowledge this packet. Let's show this process using Alice and Bob as we have previously. In the illustration, we can see that Alice has sent Bob a FIN packet. Because Bob received this, he will let Alice know that he received it and that he also wants to close the connection using FIN. Alice has heard Bob loud and clear and will let Bob know that she acknowledged this. Okay, and now let's answer the questions. What is the header in a TCP packet that ensures the integrity of data? And that will be checksum. Provide the order of a normal three-way handshake with each step separated by a comma. Okay, so we begin with sin and then comma and then sin forward slash ack and then comma and then ack like this and then we submit and we are correct. So let's move on to the next task, which is handshake. Help Alice and Bob communicate by reassembling the TCP handshake in the correct order in the static lab attached to this task. Enter the value of the flag given at the end of the conversation into the question below. And the question is, what is the value of the flag given at the end of the conversation? And let's find out. So we click on view site. Okay. And let's see. Okay. So the first, uh, the first, uh, one is sin and then it will be sin act. Yes, I can hear you. And that will be act. Okay, great. Uh, and then will be uh, data. Uh, cheesecake is on sale. And then it will be act. I hear you. And then will, it will be fin act. I'm all done. And then again, fin act. Yeah, me too. And then act. Okay, goodbye. And here we have our flag. So let's copy it and paste it down here and submit. And uh, we got that right. So we can uh, continue on to the next task, which is UDP IP. Let's see. The user datagram protocol or UDP is another protocol that is used to communicate data between devices. Unlike its brother TCP, UDP is a stateless protocol that doesn't require a constant connection, connection between the two devices for data to be sent. For example, the three way handshake does not occur, nor is there any synchronization between the two devices. Uh, recall some of the comparisons made about these two protocols in room 3 OSI model. Namely, UDP is used in situations where applications can tolerate data being lost, such as video streaming or voice chat, or in scenarios where an unstable connection is not the end all. A table comparing the advantages and disadvantages of UDP is located below. Okay, so let's take a quick look. So UDP is much faster than TCP. Uh, UDP doesn't care if the data is received or not. UDP leaves the application, user software, to decide if there is any control over how quickly packets are sent. It is quite flexible to software developers in this sense. UDP does not reserve a continuous connection on a device as TCP does. 
This means that unstable connections result in a terrible experience for the user. As mentioned, no process takes place in setting up a connection, uh, connection between two devices, meaning that there is no regard for whether or not data is received and there are no safeguards such as those often offered by TCP, such as data integrity. UDP packets are much simpler than TCP packets and have fewer headers. However, both protocols share some standard headers, which are what is annotated in the table below. Okay, and let's take a look. Time to live or TTL. This field sets an expiry timer for the packet, so it doesn't clog up your network if it never manages to reach a host or escape. Source address. The IP address of the device that the packet is being sent from so that the data knows where to return to. Destination address. The device's IP address uh, the packet is being sent to so that the data knows where to travel next. Source port. This value is the port that is opened by the sender to send the TCP packet from. This value is chosen randomly out of the ports from 0 to 65,535 that aren't already in use at the time. Destination port. This value is the port number that an application or service is running on the remote host, the one receiving the data. For example, a web server running on port 80. Unlike the source port, this value is not chosen at random. Data. This header is where the data, that is bytes of file that is being transmitted, is stored. Next, we'll come on to discuss how the process of a connection via UDP differs from that of something such as TCP. Uh, we should recall that UDP is stateless. No acknowledgement is sent during a connection. The diagram below shows a normal UDP connection between Alice and Bob. In real life, this would be between two devices. Okay, and you guys can take a quick look and I'll continue uh, down here so that we can answer the questions. So what does the term UDP stand for? And that will be user datagram protocol. So let's type that in. So user datagram protocol, like this, submit. What type of connection is UDP? And that will be stateless. So we type in stateless. What protocol would you use to transfer a file? And that will be TCP. And finally, what protocol would you use to have a video call? And that will be UDP. And now let's move on to the next uh, task, uh, ports 101. Perhaps aptly titled by their name, ports are an essential point in which data can be exchanged. Think of a harbor and port. Ships wishing to dock at the harbor will have to go to a port compatible with the dimensions and the facilities located on the ship. When the ship lines up, it will connect to a port at the harbor. Take, for instance, that a cruise liner cannot dock at a port, at a port made for a fishing vessel and vice versa. These ports enforce what can park and where. If it isn't compatible, it cannot park here. Networking devices also use ports to enforce strict rules when communicating with one another. When a connection has been established, recalling from the uh, OSI models room, any data sent or received by a device will be sent through these ports. In computing, ports are numerical value between 0 and 65,535. Because ports can range from anywhere between 0 and 65,535, there quickly runs the risk of losing track of what application is using what port. A busy harbor is chaos. Thankfully, we associate applications, software and behaviors with a standard set of rules. For example, by enforcing that any web browser data is sent over port 80, software developers can design a web browser such as Google Chrome or Firefox to interpret the data the same way as one another. This means that all web browsers now share one common rule. Data is sent over port 80. How the browser look feel and easy to use is up to the designer or the user's decision. While the standard rule for web data is port 80, a few other protocols have been allocated a standard rule. Any port that is within 0 and 1024 is known as a common port. 
Let's explore some of these other uh, protocols below. File Transfer Protocol or FTP uh, Port 21. This protocol is used by a file sharing application built on a client server model, meaning you can download files from a central location. Secure Shell or SSH Port 22. This protocol is used to securely log into systems via a text based interface for management. Hypertext Transfer Protocol or HTTP port number 80. This protocol powers the World Wide Web. Your browser uses this to download text, images and videos of web pages. Hypertext Transfer Protocol Secure or HTTPS port number 443. This protocol does the exact same as above, however, securely using encryption. Server Message Block or SMB port number 445. This protocol is similar to the File Transfer Protocol or FTP. However, as well as files, SMB allows you to share devices like printers. Remote Desktop Protocol or RDP port number 3389. This protocol is a secure means of logging into a system using a visual desktop interface as opposed to the text-based limitations of the SSH protocol. We have only briefly covered the more common protocols in cybersecurity. You can find a table of the 1024 common ports listed for more information and you guys can check them out uh, on the URL that uh, you are seeing on the screen right now. Now, what is worth uh, noting here is that these protocols only follow the standards. That is, you can administer applications that interact with these protocols on a different port other than what is the standard. For example, running a web server server on um, 8080 instead of the 80 standard port. Note how, however, applications will presume that the standard is being followed, so you will have to provide a colon along with the port number. Okay, open the site uh, attached to this task and connect to the IP address that we see on the screen right here uh, on port 1234 and you receive a flag. Okay, what is the flag received from the, uh, from the challenge? Okay, let's find out. Okay, uh, and by the way guys, uh, here we are using the application Netcat, okay, uh, if you're wondering what NC stands for. Uh, Netcat is used for, uh, you know, making connections like the one we're about to do right now, transferring data, port scanning, port listening, network monitoring, uh, and more, okay. So, uh, so yeah, so let's do what we're asked, so let's type in the IP address here, so 8.8. 8.8.8 and the port number is 1234 so 1234 and we connect and here we have our flag so let's try to copy that and paste it um, and paste it down here like this and submit Perfect. And now let's see if there's anything in uh, anything for us to do in the next uh, task, which I doubt. But let's see. Yeah, nothing here. So uh, terminate the static site lab deployed in task three and five. We have already done that, so we can click on complete it. And then yeah, join the extending your network room to continue your learning. So we can just click on complete it here. And we are done with this room. Okay, everybody, um, thank you for watching. If you found the video helpful, um, please give it a thumbs up. I would really appreciate it. And make sure to subscribe to the channel for more videos on Try Hack Me. Okay, everybody, talk to you next time.